Well, hey there, class. Welcome back to the true and accurate history of Mongolia. This is episode 7, and the year is 1820. When we left off, the Mongols had begun colonizing the New World with Samarkand and Nusarai, and were still working on conquering the southern continent, using their base of Old Sarai and taking over Seoul and Geneva. Over here on the Old Continent, Turfan and Babylon are still dealing with barbarians sprouting up in the north and in the remains of India, where there are still some people who don't agree with how things are run. But it wasn't that very important, because in 1824, the Mongols discovered that if you burned this black stuff you found underground, you could get a whole lot of power from it. And so was born coal power. This led to a whole host of innovations, as you might imagine. And it really changed the way the world worked, changed the way that war worked, and changed how people got around. Now, the 19th century was a busy time, but not a terribly violent time, all things told. There was only war ongoing with the city-states, there wasn't any war hat going on with the two new civilizations in the New World, the Iroquois and the Inca. This is because Genghis Khan was still building up his forces in the area, and waiting until he had a more clear advantage over the uh, two empires. The Iroquois were small and very peaceful, but they had a decent level of technology. Now, the Inca had a large, sprawling empire, but lower technology levels. Of course, the city-state of Genoa was here, up in the northwest of the New World, and that was something that Genghis Khan would have to take care of before he could uh, begin annexing the Iroquois and Inca nations, if indeed he so desired. Now, time passed slowly in these days, so there wasn't a whole lot going on, truth be told. Well, that's not true. There was a lot going on, but none of it was of earth-shaking historical importance, other than the discovery of coal and the advent of military science and the ideas that people were beginning to get about how coal power could be used, about how burning coal could be advantageous. Those things were pretty important, but for the most part, Monka Khan administered the Old World, Genghis Khan dealt with the Southern Continent, and Monka Temur oversaw the build-up of forces in Samarkand, in the New World. Now, it's interesting to note that in our timeline, we're seeing some fascinating developments in the way the world is shaped. In Japan, they've suffered through a massive crisis that's still ongoing. And the earthquake, and the tsunamis, now they've got three nuclear reactors, all out of control. Now they're working on them, and I've got faith in the people of Japan to be able to handle it, especially with the amount of international aid pouring in. But, all the same, it's a pretty deadly situation. I think they'd appreciate it, and I certainly would appreciate it if you could go ahead and donate to the cause of helping the people of Japan. I've got links under the video and under all my Dragon Age 2 videos as well. So it's just, uh, it's pretty easy. You click on the link, put in a credit card, send off your donation. Quick, simple, and it feels good. Now we can see here the cavalry units based on the Woshing Don rifles that they found in the southern continent are beginning to be rolled out in force. Just as in 1850, they entered the industrial era. Coal was the new gold. Coal made the world go around. And the Mongols were the first to discover it. They were the first to harness it, mine it, and master it. And of course, Pachacuti of the Inca was not very impressed with the ongoing buildup of forces of the Mongols on the edges of his empire. 
he was worried, rightfully so, as stories of how Genghis Khan had comported himself in the old world were beginning to make their way to the new world. There were fugitives and refugees from the remains of India and even the Ottoman Empire still trickling their way over to the Iroquois nation, to the Inca nation, trying to make a new life for themselves outside of the brutal militaristic regime of Mongolia. But Pachacuti and Hiawatha were both hoping that Genghis Khan would be satisfied with owning not one but two continents and would leave them be, would not try to subjugate them as he had his other rivals in the past. This may be wishful thinking or it may be what goes down in history, That's something we're going to have to watch and see. Now with the New World only a stone's throw away, Geneva became an important staging ground. Genghis Khan made his base there. And at the same time, more new weapons were being developed and introduced into the Mongol Empire. The Washington rifle, which made the bases of the cavalry units, had been modified to fire more quickly, but slightly less accurately and was given to lightly armored but heavily armed units called infantry. All they had to protect them was a bowl-shaped helmet and some tough rugged clothing. But their guns, boy their guns, those were deadly. But at the moment it seemed that there wasn't anything to use their guns on aside from the occasional barbarian. There weren't any conflicts taking place throughout most of the 19th century. It was a very quiet time for the Mongols. But as we can see, Monka Temer is beginning to organize the troops and get them going along the borders of the Iroquois nation. In the southwest, on the southern continent, Genghis Khan is preparing his own troops building up, looking for places to break into the Incan Empire, which it became more and more clear was what he desired. Now there are, there are a few city-states, about a half dozen, on islands, which are much more difficult to siege. There was Hanoi, which was the closest, and of course Florence, on the eastern edge of the Old World, was the last bastion of non-Mongolian culture in the entire area. Now, Hiawatha began to get a little suspicious of how things were going as well, even as the porcelain tower rose back in the old world in Monaco, a former city-state. This was all part of Monka Khan's plan to make the Mongolian Empire renowned not just for its military might but also for its culture. Now, he'd been building so many new cultural innovations in the old world even as the new worlds were being captured and he hoped the new culture and art and music of the Mongolian Empire would spread to the new world and show the people there that the Mongols were more than bloodthirsty warlords and that the stories of those daily tournaments and brutal infighting and violent retribution were just that, stories. Unfortunately, as we know, that was the reality of life in the Mongol Empire. If you were not strong, you were not considered a person. Or at least you were not considered to have the same rights as someone stronger than you. The entire society was organized that way. The strong survived and thrived. And this is something that Monk Khan was obviously trying to change. But the power that he was given in the old world. Now Genghis Khan heard rumors of what was going on. He got news reports from Monka Khan, but Monka Khan often hid the extent to which he was increasing culture. And in fact, in many of the cities of the old world, he had done away with the idea of daily tournaments altogether. 
and was encouraging the idea that merit could be found in other ways, not just in force of arms. This is something Genghis Khan obviously would not approve of. We're seeing here, in 1886, Monka Temur, Monka Khan's son, is beginning his conquest of Genoa, the city-state in the northwest of the New World. With New Sarai close on its borders, it seemed only logical to make Genoa a Mongol satellite state, giving a boost to Mongol presence here in the New World, starting to take over the north entirely. Now, it was going to take some time to get into the new city, especially now that the Keshik were gone. Their ranged powers and prowess had been extremely useful in conquering the city-states in the past and conquering cities in the past, but with that range advantage negated by the necessarily more limited range of the rifles, it was a question of using naval support in an attempt to break down the walls before the infantrymen could get in there and get into the streets and subdue the rebels. Well, not the rebels, are they? They're insurgents at this point. Perhaps even freedom fighters. It was at this time that the war with Brussels began in 1890 under Genghis Khan's direct control. Now, Genghis Khan himself was not at the front when the war began, as he was still organizing things over in Geneva, but he quickly made his way down to uh, give them the benefit of his extended experience. Now, railways began to spring up in the old world around this time as well. It was a much more efficient way of getting around. There you go, the fall of Genoa. Right there in 1890. It was a swift conquest, worthy of Monka Timur's father's name, worthy of being a Khan. And, once more, the Mongols had a strong presence, an undeniable presence, in the New World, one that was growing day by day. That left Florence and Brussels as the primary concerns of the day. Now Florence, obviously, as we've discussed already, was proving to be a difficult city to break into, and the naval support units had to make their way over to Florence to engage in a new type of warfare, which Monka Timur had proven in the conquest of Genoa was effective, that being long-range naval bombardment followed by land strikes. This, to an extent, negated Florence's natural defenses and made it more possible to actually conquer the city, which had not been possible before. And here we see a Genghis Khan here down in Brussels overseeing the attack, helping keep the cavalrymen ready, prepared, making sure the cannons are properly aimed. The cavalry are not really built for sieging cities, but they made an efficient harrying force. They did their job just fine, giving time for the infantry to get into place and ready to break down the walls. Now here we see the steamship, one of two the Mongols ever constructed, prowling the shallows near Florence and aiming to get rid of their outlying defenders or any naval forces they may have. Now these steamships seemed like a wonderful idea when they first became plausible a few years back. Unfortunately, they were not capable of going out into the deeper sea due to their weight. They would be tipped over by the waves, or they would sink if they ran out of enough coal. And so they were stuck patrolling the shores while the galleons and frigates went out to fight in the deeper seas, or across the ocean to fight in the New World. Nonetheless, the steamship did its job in keeping Florence's defenders busy while the frigates made their way to the city. Now, Brussels is conquered. The year is 1896. And when we return in the next lesson, we're going to see 
the fall of yet more city-states and Mongol primacy. So until then, all the best.